In October 1500, a ship was sailing on the boundless waters of the Atlantic towards Castile, coming from the newly founded colony of Hispaniola. Three men in chains were confined to a squalid space in the hold. One was the almighty Christopher Columbus, Admiral of the Ocean Sea and Viceroy of the Indies, and the other two, his brothers Diego and Bartholomew. They had been stripped of all their offices and sent back to Spain to be tried for their many misdemeanors. Just seven years before, the same Christopher Columbus had been received by the sovereigns of Spain with the greatest honors when he had returned from his first voyage attempting to reach India by sailing west. What happened to bring him to this dire situation? Upon arrival from his second voyage in 1496, Christopher Columbus was already a controversial character at the Castilian court. He claimed that he had reached the eastern coast of Asia. Still, he had yet to fulfill his promises of establishing commercial contact with the affluent markets of India. His failure to find a passage to the Indian Ocean, the critiques against his methods of government on the newly discovered islands, and the political developments in Castile, led to a delay of almost two years until his third expedition was prepared and ready to go. Meanwhile, his brothers Diego and Bartholomew were left in charge of the development of the new colony of La Isabella. The settlement, built in an unhealthy environment and without a decent harbor, was not thriving as the colonists expected. The situation worsened with an outbreak of syphilis that killed 100 of the 160 of those infected. The 400 men who were meant to form the colony's backbone started to roam the island, aiming at exploiting the indigenous population. In exchange, the islanders, seeing now clearly that the invaders were there to stay, set traps for them and killed them at any opportunity. On the other hand, their chieftains had lost prestige by being forced to pay tribute in gold and cotton to the invaders, and the people were tormented by the hard work that was imposed upon them. One year passed with no news from Columbus. The colonists felt forgotten and abandoned. Food was scarce because the crops planted according to European style yielded little, and the Spaniards were constantly harassed by the natives, who hid in the most inaccessible parts of the island. Desperate, they built a ship to sail back to Spain, but the ropes and metal parts needed to make it seaworthy were not to be found on the island. This set up a conflict between the Columbus brothers and Francisco Roldan, the Alcada Mayor or Chief Justice, who was sympathetic to the colonists' cause. He accused the brothers of intending to sail back to Castile by themselves. His reproaches also included the administration not paying the promised money to the colonists and forbidding them to marry native women. Followed by some 90 men, Waldan moved to a more sane part of the island called Chiragua. Another year and a half went by in a stalemate between the two factions, which frequently got involved in skirmishes and exchanged insults and threats. This was the situation on the island in 1498, when, back in Castile, Columbus finally managed to set sail from San Lucar de Barrameda on May 30th, with a fleet of six ships embarking on his third voyage. Three of the ships were filled with explorers, and three with soldiers, arms and provisions for Hispaniola. On the three cargo ships were also six women, four colonists' wives, and two adventurers. Upon arrival at the Canary Islands, Columbus sent the three cargo ships to Hispaniola. He headed with the other three to the Cape Verde Islands, officially to buy some oxen for the colony. From there, on July 5, 1498, he began the ocean crossing, taking a more southern course than on his previous voyages. According to his calculations, this course would take him to a region closer to the equator, where he thought the source of the precious eastern commodities was. But the journey was further delayed by the expedition hitting the doldrums and spending many days in a torrid and humid climate.
According to the account of the Admiral's son, Hernando, who accompanied his father and was just a teenager then, they thought they would be burnt alive together with the ships. Columbus's arthritis and the eye inflammation that had been torturing him for some time now worsened. When they picked up the slightest pale of wind, they decided to change the course towards the northwest. On July 31st, they reached an island Columbus called Trinidad in honor of the Holy Trinity. Then, he set foot on the southern American continent for the first time, exploring the Gulf of Peria and the mouth of Orinoco. The discovery of this enormous river that drained into the Gulf of Peria confronted Columbus with a totally unexpected situation that was difficult to explain according to his original beliefs. It was obvious that the dimensions of the river were proof of a vast land mass no one had previously known about. Still, once again, our navigator couldn't break up with his preconceptions. Hence, he had to develop a cosmographical theory of his own to reconcile this new reality with traditional knowledge. In preparation for his transatlantic voyages, Columbus combined evidence from previous travels, various academic sources, and religious texts. In the medieval Christian cosmographic system, both space and time were believed to be outcomes of the work of God and little to no room was left for anything new or unknown. Therefore, all that was discovered had to fit into the traditional frame. According to this frame, since the creation of man in the Garden of Eden, humanity had been proceeding from one civilization to another, on a line from east to west, until the end of times. Then, the world, reunited under a Christian king, would fight the Antichrist, and face the final apocalypse. Prophecies dating back to the 12th century, built upon the messianic figure of such a king, and according to a later interpretation, this last ruler was to come from Spain. The Garden of Eden was located in the extreme east, where four large rivers emerged. Columbus found a similar landscape in the Gulf of Peria, which was filled by the waters of Orinoco, divided into four waterways. But he managed again to combine his own perception with his background, rejecting the intuition of a new continent for a more familiar and comforting idea. That land was the earthly paradise. To this, he added his observation of a sudden shift of the compass in the middle of the Atlantic. This phenomenon, called magnetic declination, is known today to be caused by the inconsistency of the physical and magnetic North Pole. But back then, it led Columbus to conclude that Earth was not a perfect sphere, but instead had the shape of a pear, with a bump corresponding to the location of the paradise. However, a passage towards the actual markets where the riches of India were traded was nowhere to be found so the three ships finally headed to Hispaniola, where he had left his brothers in charge of the colony. The seat of government had been moved to the southern coast, where the city of Santo Domingo had been founded in 1496. The situation was grim. The settlers were in full rebellion against the Columbus family rule, and the three ships with provisions sent from the Canaries had not yet arrived. They reached the island only at the beginning of September, but they couldn't find Santo Domingo, and they landed precisely at Chiragua, where Francisco Roldan and his rebels were settled. Roldan claimed he was Columbus's friend, and, before the captains of the three ships acknowledged the real situation, he managed to get from them crossbows and swords, paying with gold taken from the islanders. Also, 40 men deserted the crew and joined Roldan's party. Eventually, the ships made it to Santo Domingo, but by then all the provisions were rotten. In October 1499, Roldan wrote to Archbishop Cisneros, the Queen's confessor and the future Chief Inquisitor of Castile, giving his version of the events that had taken place on Hispaniola. At the same time, Columbus wrote to the sovereigns, complaining about Roldan's revolt 
and asking them to send a law expert to settle the matter. Both letters departed on the same ship. After that, Roldan cautiously retired to some lands the Admiral had granted him in a moment of truce, waiting for the Crown's decision. Meanwhile, the Columbus brothers launched themselves in harsh retaliation against the adversary faction. Many enemies were captured and, according to their offences, were flocked, had their noses and ears cut off, or were directly hanged. On August 24, 1500, the Royal Commissioner Francisco de Bobadilla, a soldier and knight of the Order of Calatrava who had served in the wars against the Moors, landed at Santo Domingo with two ships carrying a large number of soldiers. Bobadilla earned the benevolence of the colonists at once, by announcing he had brought the money the crown owed them. He immediately declared himself governor, and heard their complaints. All the prisoners were freed. Bobadilla ruled that most of the punishments were disproportionate to the offences and had been carried on without proper procedure. People had been hanged without a fair trial and, even worse, without having the chance to go to confession. Columbus was accused of preventing the evangelization of the natives and denying food to the starving colonists. And there was plenty of evidence. After a month-long inquiry, the three brothers were stripped of all their offices and embarked for Spain in chains. The present scholarship supporting Columbus argues that Bobadilla was part of a crown's plan to place their own functionary as head of government. The same scholars bring to Columbus's defense the fact that the only testimony we have regarding his deeds on Hispaniola is that of the man who wanted his position in the administration of the island. One way or another, following the accusations of incompetence and sheer brutality that had been raised against him, the monarchs didn't take the risk of appointing the admiral to an administrative office ever again. In late October 1500, Columbus arrived in Cadiz after writing a long letter to the sovereigns during the return journey. Partly explanatory, partly exalted, almost mystical, the letter describes the humiliations and sufferings he had endured, along with all the signs he had found that proved beyond doubt that he had located the earthly paradise. He convincingly argued that finding the gold and wealth of the East was just a matter of time. The monarchs ordered his release and granted him an audience one month later. They recognized that, although he was an unsatisfactory governor, he was an excellent navigator and explorer. So, they officially released him from the post of governor of Hispaniola, forbidding him to set foot on the island again. Still, they authorized another journey, probably thinking it was a good solution to a delicate matter. The developments in Portugal also commanded this decision. Vasco da Gama had just returned, in 1499, from the first successful voyage to India. Thus, on May 30, 1502, Columbus left Cadiz with four ships. His fourth and last voyage seems to have been under the sign of bad weather. The monarchs had been right not to trust Columbus. On the pretext he was threatened by a hurricane, he immediately headed for Hispaniola. He was denied port by Bobadilla, who also refused to listen to his warning that a great storm was approaching. While Columbus took shelter in a different part of the island and only suffered minor damage, Bobadilla sailed with a large fleet headed for Castile right into the hurricane, losing 20 of his 30 ships and his life. Francisco Roldan and the brave captain Antonio de Torres, who had sailed across the ocean many times, also perished in the storm. After a brief stop at Jamaica, Columbus started exploring the coasts of Honduras, Nicaragua and Costa Rica, painstakingly looking for a passage, but to no avail. In June 1503, he was caught in another storm, sustaining significant damage, and stranded in Jamaica for the next six months. Two of his crew and six natives had to paddle a canoe, traveling 450 miles, or 720 kilometers, 
of OpenSea to ask for help from Hispaniola. But once they got there, the new governor, Nicolas do Vondo, who detested Columbus, postponed his rescue until June 1504. The fleet finally returned to San Lucar on November 7. Back in Castile, Columbus found out that his prominent supporter, Queen Isabella, had made her will. Her death the same month threw the country into yet another battle for succession, this time between the king, Ferdinand of Aragon, and their daughter, one of the mad and her husband, Philip of Austria. In February 1505, Amerigo Vespucci was invited to the court in Toro by King Ferdinand. Meeting him in Seville, Columbus asked him to intercede on his behalf and sent to his son Diego the famous letter that contradicts the legend of the competition between the two navigators. Alma Ego's intervention seems to have been successful, as shortly afterwards, Columbus moved to a residence in Valladolid, and in May 1505 he was granted a royal audience. Following this audience, King Ferdinand had some of his rights restored. His son Diego married Maria de Toledo, a member of the powerful house of the Dukes of Alba, but by that time, Columbus was too ill to attend the wedding. He died in Valladolid on May 20, 1506. If you want to find out about the mystery surrounding the location of his tomb and the fantastic journey of his remains across the next few centuries, please join me for the next video.